Hi everyone and welcome to our lecture on coral reefs. So we are continuing on with our ecosystems somewhere beautiful and tropical today and that is the coral reefs. So when we talk about corals, remember that these are stony corals. These are cnidarians. So despite the fact that they actually create this structure, this 3D ecosystem, they are still a living organism themselves, specifically a cnidarian. Remember that some key characteristics for cnidarian are the fact that they have radial symmetry, right? And they have little stinging cells. Well, so do corals. So despite the fact that they look like these big rocks, they actually are made up of individual polyps. That polyp is the same thing as like a polyp of a hydra that has that radial symmetry with a stalk on the bottom and then tentacles on the top. Um, so again, that's, the, that's what we're going to be looking at today is we're going to be looking at that um, many, many, many different polyps that make up an entire coral, and in this case, an entire coral reef. So remember that they do have those little stinging cells, they do have little nidils. Um, they, again, mostly are used for uh, capturing prey. So they're going to be those suspension feeders that are kind of hanging out, waiting for stuff to float by. They're going to grab it and then pull it towards their mouth. Um, sometimes they are used for defense, especially with each other. We're going to actually see some um, corals like competing with each other and then in that case they're actually using it for a defensive mechanism they're kind of trying to protect their area and not get out competed by another coral nearby um, so they're using that one as a little bit more of like a protection or a little defense against another coral um, let's see so again we're gonna be looking at the soft body polyp in that hard calcium carbonate skeleton so we're gonna see that in just a second um, but let's talk about some basic types of corals. Um, there's a few different, there's two different types that we're going to be focusing on in this class. One is called the hermatypic, and these are your typical coral reefs, the ones that you can think of when you go to the tropics. Um, beautiful crystal clear waters are needed, lots of sunlight are needed, and that's because they have what's called zooxanthellae. Now, zooxanthellae algae, which we've already talked about, are those symbionts that live inside the coral that actually do photosynthesis for the coral. So the, the zooxanthellae is getting a place to live, the coral is actually getting food. So as the zooxanthellae produces those sugars, some of those sugars are going to be used by the coral. So it's a very mutualistic symbiotic relationship between these two species. Um, now we're gonna, happen, we're gonna find out what happens when those zooxanthellae get rejected by the corals if conditions are not great, like things like global warming and climate change and stuff like that. So as our sea waters rise, uh, sorry, our sea temperature waters rise, um, we're going to see some nasty, unfortunately, effects on our corals. So because these guys do have those in Delhi, they need to be where it's good water clarity. So again, think of the tropics, think of where it's really clear and beautiful. If you've ever been, it's absolutely stunning. It's just this gorgeous blue crystal clear water. Um, and that's great for the algae, or I'm sorry, the zooxanthellae algae. Since they're doing photosynthesis, um, they need it to be really clear. They need it to be bright and sunny so they can actually absorb all of that light. Um, so these guys will have to remain a little bit shallower, at least anywhere where there's still light penetrating. Uh, these guys are also your reef builders. So again, when you think of a typical coral reef, you think of all of these from a typic, uh, corals. Those are the ones like the brain corals, the big staghorn corals, all of those are basically going to be typical um, hermatypic uh, corals. Now the other type is ahermatypic, and so basically these guys are not the reef builders. They do not have zooxanthellae algae, which means they're not restricted to things like good water quality and warmer waters. Well, I mean they're all kind of a little bit restricted to the warmer waters, but they don't have to deal with things like um, photosynthesis. So if they don't have the zooxanthellae, they're not doing photosynthesis and therefore do not um, have their restrictions like clear water and warm temperatures and stuff like that. Um, so again, these guys are a little bit more robust and rotund. They can basically survive in conditions that normal corals would not be able to. Um, so still corals, still polyps, still feeding like that. They're just not getting the assistance from the zooxanthellae algae and therefore not doing photosynthesis. Well, not, they don't have symbionts doing photosynthesis for them and therefore um, they don't need the sunlight the way the hermatypic corals do. Now let's talk about the anatomy of coral for a second. Uh, remember we did talk about the polyps that are growing out of the calcium carbonate skeleton. So that calcium carbonate skeleton actually gets laid down by each of these polyps and they kind of grow out of it. So we're gonna see that in the next image. They kind of grow up and up and up and up and out as they keep laying down more calcium carbonate below them. Um, the polyp always remains on the top and they are connected. So even though 
They look like individual polyps. You might think they're individuals like anemones. They're not. They're actually colonial, like the anemones that we saw in the tide pool. So if one anemone can actually bud and bud and bud and bud and bud, and so you have this whole layer that is technically an individual because they're all connected. Same kind of thing that's happening here. Um, basically, these individual polyps that are poking up are still connected via this tissue, and therefore they're sending nutrients to each other, and they are connected to each other and communicating. Um, so this is like the nervous system and basically the digestive system that's all connected between these individual polyps. Um, so that's what we see right here. Again, we have this calcium carbonate skeleton. As they grow, they lay down little by little by little and grow up and up and up. Now, this is a very slow growing process. Corals don't grow super fast. Um, so some of these big corals that you see, these really big brain corals, can be hundreds if not a thousand years old. Um, it takes a long time to grow that big. Think of like a tree, like right, one of those uh, redwood trees. They're not going to grow like that big overnight. It's going to take a long time. And same kind of thing with these corals. They're going to grow slowly over time. Now, one thing that was actually really interesting that was just studied out in Florida, and this was totally found by accident, was a scientist was doing work on these coral polyps because all the coral reefs are bleaching right now, and it's really, it's tragic, and we're losing a big ecosystem, a very, very productive ecosystem, kind of like the rainforest in, in terms of abundance and, and um, uh, diversity. So what this guy was doing is he was trying to grow these, these uh, coral polyps and he just so happened that he cut one up because you can cut these. I mean, again, they can bud asexually, which we're going to, we haven't talked about yet, but we're going to, they can bud asexually. So all you have to do is you cut them up into little sections and then they'll start spreading new buds. Well, this guy accidentally cut them way too tiny. He cut really little pieces. He almost like shredded them and he was like, oh, okay, well that's not going to work. And then what he found is that those individuals, those little tiny pieces started budding like crazy. So instead of having one coral that can maybe bud here, sorry, yeah, one coral that can bud here and here and here, right? Now you have all these little tiny pieces and they're all budding off each other. So this is actually a really amazing thing. If we can reproduce this, if we can take these coral polyps and we can chop them up and then replant them out in the ocean and secure them and fasten them, um, we can start new coral reefs. We can grow new coral reefs. Despite the fact that they, um, the existing ones have been bleached, there's still structure there. And if we can attach new polyps on, then eventually they will reproduce with each other um, and they will start to grow and they will start to bud and and we could potentially restore our coral reefs. So that was an amazing, amazing find. I was out in Florida. I forget what college um, it was, but now this is something that we're going to be looking into to repopulating coral reefs because that's something that's already been happening for the last couple of years. Scientists know how important it is to keep these coral reefs healthy and stocked with polyps, meaning these big coral structures, because a lot of coral reef organisms survive just on these polyps and we're going to talk about that later when we get to the ecology part um but they are still very very important so if we can go back and we can actually you know take little snippets of these corals and replant them out um the coral reefs actually might stand a chance so fingers crossed that it works guys all right oh sorry um before i get ahead of myself this is again this is the polyp right here kind of looks like an anemone um these are little mesenterial filaments right here this is almost like the digestive system in fact they do secrete digestive enzymes to help with digestion, um, but they can also, if they need to, say if they don't have the zooxanthellae anymore, they can actually extend those outside of their bodies and actually digest things from outside of their bodies, kind of like those sea stars that we learned about, and then pull them back in. So that's pretty cool. The tentacles, you guys are used to the tentacles, right? This is all just cnidarian tentacles with those little stinging cells on it. And again, this is how they're connected. So this thin... Um, connective tissue that actually goes from polyp to polyp to polyp is what actually coats the entire coral. So if you see it and it's like that brownish color, the calcium is, the calcium carbonate is white essentially, which is why when they bleach, they turn white because all the, it's left is the skeleton. But that thin film that actually surrounds the coral gives the coral their color. More specifically, the zooxanthellae species that they have inside their tissues is going to is going to be what gives the coral their specific color. It's dependent on the specific type of zooxanthellae. Um, now again, we already talked about how each coral polyp is going to lay down a little bit of calcium um, carbonate skeleton as they grow up, 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 and so that's what's going to make that three D rock structure. Um, is going to be that basically each one of those polyps is going to grow and lay down a little bit more of that calcium carbonate skeleton. Um, most of them are really, really small, one to three millimeters. That's like really, 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 really tiny. Um, but when you actually look at the whole 
co uh, coral together and you count up all the polyps and all the, you know, that connective tissue, you can actually get a pretty large animal, despite the fact that each polyp is very, very tiny. In fact, sometimes you, when you see these corals, you actually have to go up to it almost with a magnifying glass and look at it and be like, oh, there are little coral polyps there. Um, because really what they look like from afar is just rocks, right? They look like those just kind of jaggedy rocks that are in the, in the tropics, but it's not. It's actually those carcin carbonate skeletons with very, very tiny little polyps. Uh, we talked about the zooxanthellae already, but it's very important to the corals to have the zooxanthellae. Remember, the specific zooxanthellae species is going to give the coral their specific color, which is why you can see all those brightly different colored um, corals in the tropics. Um, and again, it's just a very mutualistic relationship between the two. They're sharing their resources. They're sharing, the coral is sharing its 3D structure and home and habitat for the zooxanthellae. The zooxanthellae is sharing its product of photosynthesis with the coral. So it's very mutualistic and beneficial for both of them. Um, if there's enough zooxanthellae in the coral and the zooxanthellae is nice and happy and healthy and getting all the sunlight that it needs, the coral actually doesn't even need to feed. It can actually survive just on the zooxanthellae. Now, when we talk about coral bleaching, when conditions get bad, they can actually kick their zooxanthellae out. Now, the corals are not dead when they kick their zooxanthellae out, but they are kind of like starving to death. Um, corals, yes, they have those little polyps that they can reach out and they can do that suspension feeding for, but it's not super efficient, especially because there's not a lot of nutrients in the tropics. That's why the waters are so crystal clear and beautiful. You don't have the zooplankton, you don't have the phytoplankton, you don't have that base level of food. Um, so there's really not a ton of food for them left to eat and that's why eventually they usually starve and end up dying. Um, uh, we talked about how the fact that they have um, nematocysts, those little stinging cells, nidils, just like um, you know the regular uh, nidarians that we've seen in the past, they're the same exact thing like that. So they can't feed themselves Again, they're just not really good at it. So if it was temporary, yeah, sure, they'd be able to survive just fine. If they were able to reabsorb those ozenthelae, they'd probably be okay. Um, but unfortunately, that's not usually how it works, especially because of climate change. Those, wa those warm waters, they get too hot for the corals, kind of stay too hot for too long. Um, and the corals usually don't survive that. So. Um, we talked about the mesenterial filaments. This is, again, those little digestive system that's going to kind of be able to get extended outwards and then secrete that digestive enzymes outwards that allow them to eat externally and then pull those nutrients back inside of them, just like the sea star that we talked about. Um, so, yeah, the coral can feed itself with these little filaments if it absolutely has to. If the zooxanthellae is safe, if it's cloudy, if it's stormy, there's not a lot of sunlight. Um, you know, temporarily, absolutely, these corals can be able to feed themselves. And even for extended periods of time, if there's enough food. Um, usually in the tropics, that's not usually the case, but if there is, then the corals would be fine without the zooxanthellae. Now, let's talk about some conditions that are needed for these corals to actually survive. Um, is one, we need some hard substrate. This is really crucial. We've talked about this before when it comes to the intertidal organisms. You can't, if you're a sessile organism that's going to sit on the bottom and stay on the bottom and be attached to the bottom, you cannot do so if it's a sandy bottom, right? You can't attach the sand because otherwise you're just going to roll away. So these guys need a hard substrate to actually be able to attach onto, like the barnacles, like the oysters, stuff like that. Once they get any little bit of hard structure, then they're secure. They can grow off and sometimes you'll see a very small coral that's like super branched but only attached to this one little part. So they really don't need a lot. And then, of course, as corals die, other organisms are going to grow on those corals. In fact, sometimes corals grow on other dead corals. Um, so again, you get that building, that 3D structure, that rugosity. Remember that, that word that's so important, rugosity, complexity. Because um, now you have all these little microhabitats that, that organisms can live in, including other corals. So sometimes, just like the oyster reefs that we talked about, sometimes these first coral reefs are really important to future ecosystems because even though the coral died, they have created a hard structure, an actual reef for other organisms to be able to settle on and to survive on. Um, optimal light, that should not be shocking to you guys, if, especially if it's a hermatypic type of coral, they need light. They need light to do their photosynthesis and therefore you have to have some kind of clear water. You, you can't be just like the seagrasses we talked about. You can't be too deep if the water's murky. You have to be shallow. In the tropics, the water is fairly deep, um, you know, 200 meters, 100 me uh, 200 feet, 100 feet, stuff like that, um, and still crystal clear all the way to the bottom. In fact, there are places in the tropics where you can see down 100 feet. It's stunningly beautiful if you've never been. 
Um, like I said, you guys know my dad lives in the Florida Keys. I always talk about it. Um, and that's where you see, I mean, we can be at 100 feet, 90, well, maybe not 100 feet. Um, conditions would have to be really good for you to see at 100 feet. But we can be 60, 70 feet, and you can actually still see the bottom. Um, it makes it seem like it's really close. So you can just dive down and touch it, and then you try, and it's not close at all. <laughs> um, a narrow temperature range. So most people think of like, oh, the corals like it warm. Yes, they do like it warm. Too cold, they don't do well. Too hot, they don't do well. So this is a whole climate change thing. Um, this is why we don't call it really global warming anymore, because yes, on average, the entire planet's temperature is increasing. But when it comes to certain conditions, sometimes it's really, really hot, and sometimes it's really, really cold. So the cold is getting colder, and the hot is getting hotter. So either one of these is, is bad for the corals, because they have this very narrow temperature range that they can survive in. And we're going to go into more about that in just a second. Um, they also have a narrow salinity range. If you're out in the tropics, in the water, you probably don't have a lot of fluctuation in your salinity. Yes, you have storms that come in, so you have added fresh water, but because you're talking about such huge volumes of water, the salinity is usually pretty consistent. This isn't like the intertidal zone or the estuaries where you have a lot of fluctuation throughout the day. It's pretty consistent in the corals, um, and that's good for them because they can only survive. Now, as things like, when we talk about the narrow range of pH, as things like climate change again happen, something called ocean acidification is happening, meaning the more, pump, the more we pump out CO2 into the atmosphere, just because, you know, when people breathe, you release CO2. Um, we raise things like animals for food. They breathe and release CO2. We drive cars, which release CO2. We do industry, which releases CO2. Pretty much every single thing we do on the planet releases some kind of CO2. That's that carbon footprint that people talk about. So the more CO2 that there is in the atmosphere, the more CO2 gets dissolved into the, to the ocean. When it gets dissolved into the ocean, it actually mixes with the seawater and there's chemical reactions that happen that turn it into carbonic acid. So now you have acid that's being produced in the ocean just because there's CO2 in the air. So these chemical reactions create this carbonic acid, which increases, sorry, because it's pH, decreases the pH, causing it to go away from seven, which is neutral, closer to one, which is very acidic. And that change in pH is actually killing the corals like big time. So they have these, I mean, you know, uh, light conditions have to be great. Salinity has to be great. pH has to be great. Um, very little sediment, little pollution. All of these things are things that we're kind of messing up right now. And therefore that's why corals are taking it so hard. Um, pollution levels, corals really cannot handle pollution at all. The tropics um, and warm waters like that, they're very, they're pristine, they're gorgeous. We don't have, um, you know, there's not a lot of big islands in, in the tropics. I mean, I think Cuba is the biggest one. Um, I mean, obviously if you go to like the tip of Australia, but that's like a continent. Um, I'm thinking like directly along the equator. Um, but there's not a lot of, of industry there. There's not a lot of people who live in those areas. Um, it's mostly these small series of islands and therefore there's not a ton of pollution. So when we do start to pollute a lot more, um, the corals are the first ones that actually get hit really hard. They can't take pollution very well at all. Um, and also sediments in the water. So, uh, remember the water clarity is really, really key because you need that, that sunlight for photosynthesis. But too much sediment actually falling on the corals is also bad. They get kind of covered in this, this layer. Um, and again, you can't just brush yourself off. It doesn't work that way. So if you have too much sediment in the water, it settles on the corals and it blocks their photosynthesis. It's just, it's all sorts of not bad. And usually with those sediments, because we're humans, there's pollutants in those sediments. So as we stir up the bottom, we stir up, especially anywhere near land, um, where there are people living, you stir up those sediments, which have now pollutions in them. And then you're coating these little coral reefs with pollution. Um, so not, not good for them at all. And they're very, they're not resilient. They're not robust. They're not, they can't withstand these, these negative conditions. So as we pollute, as we change the pH, as we do all this kind of stuff, they're just, they're just taking it from every angle, which is just really bad. All right, but let's get on to what they actually do need to survive. Um, let's talk about how they reproduce first. So corals are cnidarians, right? We've talked about how cnidarians can either reproduce asexually, meaning that they just bud off. So imagine there's a little me right here and it just buds off and then I float away and there's just another little me. Bye. Okay, that's known as budding. That's asexual, right? There's no sexual recombination. It's just a little clone of you that buds off. 
Um, that's how each one of those coral polyps can, you know, come around. There's one, and then they grow another one, and then they grow another one. Um, if you're not going to go through asexual reproduction, you're going to go through sexual reproduction. This is one of the species that creates that planula larvae that we talked about. Um, so again, they're going to create this larvae that's able to float around with the currents, and that's a good thing because now they're actually sending their genes off to a different location. Remember, if you're budding, right, essentially if I'm budding right here, maybe this little bud pops off, maybe it floats around for a while, maybe it lands right there. So now you're essentially, ne your next door neighbor is related to you. So if you did want to go through sexual reproduction, the closest person you could do that with is, it's essentially a copy of yourself. Um, and that's not what sexual reproduction is all about. You don't want to reproduce with yourself. You want new genes. You want to introduce new genes, get variations, stuff like that in your population. Um, and therefore, you need to reproduce with someone who's not related to you. So that's why this planula larvae is great, because it can actually butt off, swim around in the plankton for a while, and then by the time it settles, it's far away from the original parent. So, or parents, because it's sexual. Um, so then it's far away from the parents, and therefore, whoever it chooses to reproduce, chooses, however it reproduces with later on is probably not going to be a relative of them and therefore that's going to be better for the offspring. Uh, we already talked about lights. It's very important to have light. Um, you need it for the zooxanthellae to do their photosynthesis so the water quality, quality has to be good, it has to be clear, and it has to be bright and sunny for these things to happen. Um, corals can live deep if there is light. Like I said, um, there's, there's light that penetrates down to 200 meters, and so you can get some corals that are living as deep as 150 meters if the water quality is clear enough. Um, when I was diving in Cuba, we went to 150 feet, which is deep, deeper than most recreational divers go, um, and it was still bright. I mean, in fact, I could see the surface. I could see the surface and the waves kind of brushing on the surface at 150 feet. So, yes, there were corals down there at 150 feet. Everything appears blue. Everything. You're like, that fish swims by and you're like, I know it's yellow, but it, it kind of looks blue. Remember, because blue is the deepest um, light color spectrum that actually penetrates the farthest down. Um, so yes, they can be found very, very deep. They're not completely primarily shallow if water quality is good. And in Cuba, it was stunning. So this is the south end of Cuba. It was like the Bay of Pigs. Oh my God. Amazing. Amazing. Um... Most of the time, corals are going to be found over continental shelves, which makes sense because the continental shelf is about, um, it's, you know, going anywhere from zero to 200 meters and then it starts to drop off with your continental slope. If light only penetrates really well to the first 200 meters, then you're only really going to get corals on that continental shelf before it starts dropping down. Now, there are some deeper water species corals. Um, those are the ones that would not rely on things like photosynthesis because of the zooxanthellae. So those would be found a little bit deeper, but normally they're always going to be found over the continental shelf, um, which is again, when people think of, oh, the ocean is so big and there's just so much things. If you go far enough out, it's really not. The majority of life is always going to be found over the continental shelf. Uh, temperature requirements. Again, um, these reef building corals, um, have a very low temperature range compared to some of these other corals. So they really can't deal with great temperature fluctuations. Um, they can really only be active over 68 degrees. So if it drops dip below that, they're not really going to be able to reproduce and grow. They're going to be able to survive for a while, but they're not going to be able to reproduce and they're not going to be able to grow new polyps. Um, so that's really not good conditions. So anything less than 68 degrees is almost too cold for them. They almost kind of go into hibernation and wait for it to get a little bit warmer. Um, now colder than that, if you get down into the fifties and stuff, this is where you can really get some like coral deaths if it gets really cold. Um, but most of the time it's, you know, on average, it's not too bad. And they just kind of like, kind of wait for it to get, um, wait for it to get warmer before they actually start growing and stuff like that again. Um, when it's too hot, remember we talked about the whole um, climate change thing. So too cold, bad. They won't grow, they won't reproduce. Too hot, they die off. And what happens is they die off because they start bleaching, sorry, they start kicking out their zooxanthellae, which causes them to bleach, it causes them to lose that color. Um, and therefore they can't feed themselves anymore if they don't have that zooxanthellae. So anything over 86, so 68 is the magic number. 86 is the magic number. So anywhere between 68 and 86, right? That's your that's your money spot right there. That's where you really want to be to get the optimal amount of uh, coral reef growth. 
Um, again, we already talked about what happens when they bleach. Essentially, they, they eject these little zooxanthellae from inside of their tissues outwards. And then, therefore, the zooxanthellae die because they don't have a place to live. And the corals eventually will starve and die off because they were not able to feed themselves efficiently enough. Um, so this is exactly what we see right here. This is a nice, healthy coral. We can see it's dark color. If we were to actually look up close, you could see tiny little polyps. And you could see this almost like skin-ish material that's kind of connecting them. That's all their connective tissue. And then on the uh, on this side right here, we can see that it is completely white. And that is not because somebody actually threw it in bleach. It is bleached because they kicked out all that zooxanthellae. And it turns that bright white color. Now again, just because it is bleached doesn't mean that it is dead. It, typically means that it is dying, right? It loses its color because that's a zooxanthellae and eventually won't be able to feed itself efficiently enough and will probably die off. Now, like I said, it's not the end of the world. If they bleach, they can come back, but conditions really have to be optimal for that to happen. Otherwise, um, most of the time they do end up just dying off. Okay, um, we talked about this already. Lots of things can cause them to, to bleach. It's not just um, a lack of, uh, or sorry, it's not just when temperatures are too hot. Um, things like pollutants in the water, again, will cause it to bleach. Um, pH is causing it to be, to bleach, the pH being all sorts of off. Um, during El Nino years, El Nino years, the waters are typically very, very warm. So again, too warm for the corals and therefore other species might do well when it's warm. Like my species of fish, the giant sea bass, um, they, their babies do amazing if it's a El Nino year, but the coral reefs do terrible, just like the kelp forests do terrible in El Nino years. So it's a lot of times you get a lot of die off during those years. Um, so it's almost kind of like a fluctuation between organisms that are doing better in El Nino years, organisms that are doing worse, and how these conditions kind of change over time. Um, hurricanes also are terrible for coral reefs, and we've had increased amount of hurricanes lately, not just increased amount, but increased intensity. And if you've never been to an area that's susceptible to hurricanes, is if you look at the water a long time after a hurricane, it is murky. It is murky, it is gross because everything's been stirred up. You're talking about 10 foot waves, you're talking about these huge amounts of wind that are coming in, 60, 70 mile an hour winds, which are creating all this turnover. All this turnover is gonna stir up the bottom. So all those sediments are gonna float around for a while. And remember we learned, Corals don't like sediments, right? They don't want sediments sitting on top of them. They don't want the pollution that's in the sediments. All of those things are going to be bad for the corals. And therefore, their water quality goes down. Their water clarity goes down. They can't do the photosynthesis that they need. Pollutants start coming out. Um, all sorts of crazy things can happen. And therefore, you know, hurricanes and storms can, can do really a lot of damage on um, coral reefs. Not just increased temperatures, you know, natural phenomena as well. Uh, salinity, we talked about salinity. Remember, normally it's about 35 parts per thousand or 3.5%. Either one is the same thing. Um, so normally that you will not find any kind of coral reefs near freshwater sources. Unlike estuaries, which are where freshwater meets the ocean, coral reefs do not like freshwater. They don't want their salinity changes. They want it nice and consistent and calm. And most of the time in tropics, that is true. Again, with those hurricanes that are coming in, a lot of times you have tremendous amount of rainfall, lots and lots of rainfall for extended periods of time, sometimes days at a time before the storm actually comes in and then it hits really hard and then it's a couple days afterwards. So depending on the size of the hurricane, you can actually get a lot of fresh water that will decrease your salinity because now you have more water and less salts. So a lot of these things, again, can cause a lot of stress for these corals. Um, so too low salinity, again, if you have too much rainfall, the, the salinity drops and therefore they will also cause bleaching because the corals are like, I don't understand this new salinity. I'm not okay. And they, they, it's almost like an emergency mechanism. They are like, I don't know what to do. Ah, and they just like spell their zooxanthellae. That's not a good thing, but they don't know any better. They're like, I don't know. I don't know. Pfft, maybe this will work. And it does the exact opposite um, because it actually starves them to death instead of saving them, which is what they're trying to do. So the whole reason they expel themselves, the, the zooxanthellae, they're trying to save themselves. But it has the opposite effect. Um, so wave action, there's not a ton of wave action in the tropics, depending on where you are. If you go to, say, Hawaii, they're definitely, there's, they're windy all the time. So you have a lot of wave action there. Um, these things can do, these things can do damage to corals. Um, 
Again, you have that wave action, you're going to be stirring up the sediment, that sediment's going to have pollutants in it, it's going to cover the algae, or sorry, the corals, it's going to be all sorts of bad. So any time of heavy wave action, they're probably not going to do well on. Um, also, you know, their little polyps are a little sensitive, so too much wave action, those little polyps are going to be the ripped off. Um, so not good for those little corals. Uh, pollution, remember we talked about how most things are not going to do well with pollution, but especially corals. Corals just can't handle almost any level of pollution. So the more we pollute things like the Great Barrier Reef, the more we're going to lose things like the Great Barrier Reef, which has been around for millions of years. Um, and just now is only starting to die off because of humans. Like that's not a phenomenon that happens. You know, you didn't have that coral reef for a million years just to lose it all of a sudden in a decade because of chance. I mean, that's 100% us. Um, and that's, that's really pretty sad. So one of the other things that can happen with pollution is like I said, when you stir up those sediments and those nutrients and stuff like that, you're releasing those nutrients back into the ecosystem. Now the corals don't need nutrients, but things like algae do. Now algae are competing with corals and therefore, um, if there's too many nutrients in the water, you're going to have an algae bloom. You're going to have an increase in the amount of algae that you have. This algae bloom, again, is going to compete with the corals. And sometimes algae grows faster than corals. So now on your, on your little coral reef right here, what you're going to have is you're going to have a layer of algae that comes in and sits on top and grows over because they're competing for sunlight. Okay, so the nutrients in the water are going to allow the algae to grow really, really fast and potentially cover and completely cover that, that coral. And now the coral can't do photosynthesis. The algae is going to do fine, but the coral is going to die off. And that's unfortunately a, something that we're seeing a lot right now of is these dead corals where ideally it would be a good substrate for other corals to eventually land on and settle are now already covered in algae. And again, if you're already covered in algae, you can't, you can't have a coral polyp land there and start to, you know, um, start to grow if you're already covered in algae, right? It's not going to be able to land on the algae and grow on the algae. So then the algae is going to outcompete the corals and the corals aren't going to be able to come back. So not a good thing. All right, so let's talk about some different types of corals. We already talked about hermatypic versus ahermatymic, but let's talk about the physical structures and what they look like. So there are two different types. One is going to be a taller, more branching form that's going to grow tall and then kind of branch out. These are going to be typically form, uh, found in shallower waters, and that's because the competition for light is pretty high. Um, and therefore, you want to grow pretty much up as fast as you can to outcompete anybody else who might grow over you. Uh, and then you want to branch to make sure that you get as much sunlight hitting every little part of you as possible. Um, the alternative is going to be the flatter, wider form. So this is going to be a little bit deeper water. Now, they still have competition for light, but all you need to do is you need to kind of spread yourself out nice and wide because the competition for space isn't as high because not all, all, re all corals can live as deep as these uh, flatter ones. But if you're big and wide and flat, then you can actually get whatever little sunlight is coming down. You can actually maximize that by being big and wide and flat instead of being on the, you know, the shallower waters where there's lots of competition. And therefore, you want to sprout up first and, and quickly and then kind of branch out a little bit so that you can still get all the sunlight up here, whereas your neighbor would probably be here versus the deeper water ones, which are almost going to try to outcompete each other by growing over each other and shadowing each other. Um, so that's coral reef competition right there. Now, there are some developmental stages that lead up to an actual coral reef. Um, the first one is going to be a fringing reef, followed by a barrier reef, and the last one is going to be an atoll. So we're going to go through these steps right now, and I would definitely know how these at least are formed, and it might be a good essay question. I don't know. All right, so let's start with a fringing reef. A fringing reef, for anybody who knows what fringe is, it's kind of like fringe and it kind of goes on the outside. Well, that's what a fringing reef is. Imagine you have a volcano that poked up, right? So you had your volcanic activity, you have your volcano plume, and that's building and building and building, and from the bottom of the ocean, we now have an island that arises. So now we have our island. Well, what's going to happen is a fringing reef is going to be surrounding the outside of that island. And that's what we're going to see right here uh, in just a second. So they are the simplest form. It's kind of the first formation. So it goes from fringing reef to barrier reef to atoll. Now, it doesn't always get all the way to atoll. Sometimes it stays a fringe reef. Um, but the fringe reef is always going to be the first one because, again, you have your newly formed island that just poked up. And now you're going to have organisms that are going to start to settle around that island. And one of them are going to be your corals. Um, so these guys are basically 
right here. So we have our island, which is poked up here, and our reef, our fringing reef, which is going to go all the way on the outside. So like fringe, it's going to go all the way around on the outside. So imagine that you have this newly formed island, and now you're going to have new land. You're going to have organisms that settle there, like the corals. And of course, they're going to be first around the very, you know, right outside of the island, and then boom, they're going to build and build and build and build and build. And so that's what we have here. It was probably a very small coral reef in the beginning that started way on the inside here, and then it's going to work its way out and out and out and build bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as years go on. Um, now, because this is attached to land, the growth isn't as fast as some of the other coral reefs that are built. Um, you have things like runoff, you have things like sediments, you have things like maybe pollutants coming off of the land. So your growth is going to be a little bit slower than it would normally be, and you also have wave action, right? If you're out in the middle of the ocean, there's not going to be any waves because there's no land. Waves are created by land, something we learned early on in the semester. So as the, as the, you know, the land gets shallower and shallower and shallower, the waves that are traveling like this are going to hit the land and then build up and then finally crash onto shore. So that's why you're going to get a lot more wave action, which is going to stir up more sediment. You're going to get runoff from the island. So again, it's going to be a slow growing reef, um, this fringing reef, because you are so associated with land, which corals typically aren't good with. Now, the barrier reef is next. Um, so just like the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, it is kind of like a barrier. So imagine uh, you have your fringing reef, and this can happen in one or two ways. One, you have your fringing reef, and it kind of works its way out. Um, but really what's happening is your island was created by a plume of, of lava and magma and stuff like that that actually builds up and builds up and builds up. Well, sometimes those little deposits go dry, and instead of continuing to push them up and up and up, they now are dry and they empty out, and essentially you have this cavern here, and the island starts to sink back down. So now what you had is you had this island here with a fringing reef around it. The fringing reef is made of calcium carbonate, essentially concrete. So now your island is sinking, 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 sinking. Now maybe your island is only this big, and your fringing reef is still all the way out here. So this is now a fringing reef that has been separated from the actual island itself, creating a barrier. So now around your little island here, you have almost like a circle protecting that island. That is the barrier part, okay? Um, this is where you basically have um, that little barrier on the inside known as a lagoon. So you have your outside open ocean, right? And on the inside, you have this little lagoon. Now you can still have reefs inside the lagoon, absolutely. You can still have fish inside the lagoon. They're usually pretty deep. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Castaway with Tom Hanks, right? Remember, he had to use that little sail thing to get over the second set of waves. So the first set of waves, I think even Moana, this was even in Moana, because um, these are very actually common, these barrier reefs. And so in the beginning, you know, you have your little lagoon and you can fish a lagoon and it's really protected. Um, and there are waves that lap up on shore, nice and little. But then you go out and as soon as you hit that barrier reef, now you're talking about the waves that have come in, not just from your lagoon, but from the ocean itself, the entire ocean. So the waves that are going to hit on the outside of the barrier reef are going to be the big ones. And that's what both Moana and Tom Hanks had to get up and over to get out to sea. Um, so again, it's a little bit, here we go. So we have our island right here. It's sunk down a little bit, creating this little lagoon. This hard reef right here, this is all calcium carbonate. That's not going to go anywhere. Just because your soft sediment is now sinking back in here, this reef, this hard calcium carbonate reef, isn't going to go anywhere. Not to mention, over long periods of time, thousands and thousands, maybe even millions of years, you have um, buildup of sediments. So as these like 3D reefs slow the water flow down, whatever sediments were floating in it are going to settle, creating these little um, K's or keys. Remember that little islands are called keys here in the States, or K's, C-A-Y-E-S, anywhere else. So this would be a little sand K, or here in the States, a key, like the Florida Keys. Um, where it's basically just a buildup of sediment just on an ancient reef that is just kind of like the shallow little bit of uh, land that's kind of popping off a little bit. Think Pirates of the Caribbean when they're fighting on that really shallow beach surrounded by water on that little tiny island. I think it's like the second one, third one, I don't remember. Um, that would be like a key or a K, right? Just a small buildup of sediment. So we have this protected little reef on the inside, sorry, protected little uh, lagoon on the inside here. You have your barrier reef right here creating a barrier protecting your lagoon from the outside deep open ocean here. Now this fore reef right here is uh, usually pretty steep sloping. 
for the fringing reef because again it was an island but now it's sunk back down at least this part is sunk back down and now you basically just have here so you're gonna get that nice steep sloping face um this is great for fish so a lot of think uh, Nemo right Nemo was up here on the little reef and he looked out into the deep open ocean and he's like oh I bet you can't go out here right and then the Barracuda was waiting for him that's what a lot of predatory animals do um, so a lot of fishermen will actually fish this outside of the reef right here because you have deeper water things like fish and sharks and stuff like that which are waiting for these smaller reef fishes to kind of leave the safety of the reef and then they're going to ambush them from that outside there so very very productive areas so again, this is exactly what you can see right here. This at one point was some kind of island. It's starting to sink back down now. Now you actually have your, um, this is your little lagoon right here, and then your uh, barrier reef right here. Actually, it's kind of hard to see which way this one's going. Yeah, I'd say this is the island, and this is the barrier reef, and this is, yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, barrier reef, creating a barrier 3D structure around what uh, island you used to have. Um, so the water drops very, very quickly. We already talked about that. Waves are bringing that sediment up, creating those little keys or those caves. Um, so if there's too much sediment, especially on that, that four reef part, that, that outside part where it's meaning the deep ocean, ocean, deep water, you're getting a lot of wave action there. So you're going to get a lot of sediments being stirred up there. Any kind of sand that's being, that's trying to settle right there is going to be stirred up if the wave action gets too big, like in Tom Hanks or Moana. Um, and therefore some of that uh, can slow the growth of the, uh, the coral reefs from growing. Um, we already talked about it. Remember that there are keys here in the United States or caves anywhere else in the world. So those little sand caves that we saw are also known as keys. Um, that's essentially what the Florida Keys are made of. It's off the southern tip of Florida. It's a series of these dotted little islands. Those are all corals. And they're all, that's why they're kind of in that shape is because they were a coral reef. They just built this long structure and then eventually little bits of it actually started poking up out of land and that's how we got our keys. Like the Florida Keys, how we got those little islands. Um, if you go out there and you actually look for a beach, there's like no real beaches. All the real beaches there have had sand imported in because essentially every single one of those islands is just coral. And you can actually look at that. There's this really cool um, cutout for boats to go through. And they basically just cut a long path through two of these keys to make a to make a path for the boats. And you just see in both sides of the walls, it's just coral. And you can see the corals, you can see the rocks, you can see those little structures and stuff like that. It's actually really fascinating. And those are millions, if not, nah, probably millions and millions of years old. You know, maybe even like 500 million years old. It's crazy how old some of these reefs are and have been around for a very, very long time. The Great Barrier Reef, some it's like my life goal to go there, my like dream trip if I'd go there right now if I could. Um, unfortunately, it's, well, fortunately, it's one of the largest, if not the largest reef in the entire planet. It's huge. It's massive. It's like 200 miles long, sometimes up to, to 20, 30 miles wide. It's just massive. Sorry, 1,200 miles long, up to 200 miles wide. It's huge. It's just massive. And this is why it's called the Great barrier reef because it is a barrier right protecting essentially the continent of Australia it's all along the outside of that um and there's a ton of little islands on it a ton of little keys on it and stuff but what's happening just like with all of our coral reefs all over the planet is it's dying off and it's dying off at a really alarming rate and it's really really sad that that's happening um and potentially within our lives uh, the reefs could be gone and not gone obviously the, the structures the skeletons will still be there but all the diversity, all the fish, all the sharks, all the amazing things that would have been there if it was a healthy ecosystem could potentially be gone in our lifetime. And that is just sad because when I was a kid, the Great Barrier Reef was like the most pristine place in the world. And even just 30 years later, it's it's almost, I mean, I think they're saying it's like 50% gone. And that's just in 30 years. Like imagine the next 10 years, even it could be down to 10% of what it could be. And that's just, that's terrible because I mean, that's a huge ecosystem producing a lot of life, producing a lot of oxygen too. Remember that these photosynthetic organisms are producing oxygen for us. So we're essentially suffocating ourselves by killing the ocean, which is no bueno. And here's what it looks like. Just miles and miles and miles and miles of these like shallow water lagoons, these big, beautiful coral reefs, these deeper water arrows, meaning these shallow, shallow bays and stuff. It's just, 
it's just stunning and I, I, I really want to go there before it completely, completely goes away. So, I don't know. Do your part, people. All right. Back to the uh, sequence of events. Remember, we went from the fringing reef to the barrier reef. Now we're going to go to an atoll. So, we had our big island. It popped all the way up. We built a fringing reef. Right now, the island starts to shrink back down. Now we have our barrier reef with a little lagoon. Now the island essentially is gone, and you just have that barrier reef with no island in the middle. This is known as an atoll. So it's basically a circular reef structure that was surrounding an island at some point. The island is gone. Now you just have this big, round atoll, um, like the movie Waterworld. Right? There's a reason they were called atolls, right? Big, round, protected areas with water on the inside and water on the outside. Um, Okay, so this is exactly what we see right here. This island went up and then it went back down. And now what we have right here is we have our little lagoon on the inside and we have a very steep uh, four reef over here surrounding it, but we have kind of a series of these little K's or keys which are kind of popping up. I know it's kind of hard to see. Well, you guys have the PowerPoint. But again, it's this central little lagoon right here surrounded by these little keys right here. Sometimes they're connected, sometimes they're not connected. Um, but again, it creates this circular, this 3D circular structure around this little lagoon on the inside. These areas, again, are very, very productive because you have the deep water on the outside that the predators are using, as well as the shallow protected inside, which things like are used for like nursery areas and stuff like that. So very productive and very, um, beneficial to the ecosystem. So again, this is where you have that volcanic island form and then it started to basically just drop back down and that's what you can see, um, f the formation of the atoll. So the island is going to completely disappear and you're basically just going to be left with the central central lagoon and nothing else. Okay, just to, to again go back and rehash, we had our fringing reef right here, which surrounds the island. The island was a volcano that popped up just like the Hawaiian Islands. Then eventually again, you're going to have that decrease, that shrinking of the island as it sinks back in. That's going to create that barrier reef, which once was a fringing reef, has now turned into a barrier reef because we have this little lagoon. And then as you continue to lose the island, as it sinks, sinks, sinks down in here, um, you basically have the barrier reef or the fringing reef on the outside that's left, which is now turned into an atoll because you just have the lagoon on the inside and no island left. All right, so moving right along to coral reef ecology. Um, again, we are very limited in the tropics. You don't have things like a lot of phytoplankton. You don't have a lot of zooplankton, which means you don't have a lot of primary producers in that area. So yes, you have some algae. Yes, you have some coral. They're all contributing to the primary producing, um, but it's it's very limited. So competition is extremely high on the coral reefs because you're missing that basal level of the food chain. You're essentially just in direct competition with each other constantly. And it's not just always for food. If you are one of those photosynthetic organisms, you're fighting over light, right? Space is limited too, so you're gonna be fighting over light, you're gonna be fighting over space. Competition just in general on the coral reefs is very, very high. Um, because of these low nutrients, you don't get a lot of things like algae, so again, you don't have that basal level of that food chain, which makes it very difficult for everything above that basal level to survive because there's such high competition for everything. Um, let's see. Again, everything's kind of based around the bottom of the food chain in every ecosystem. So in this ecosystem, the zooxanthellae are actually kind of the bottom of the food chain, the basal level, and therefore very, very important. So not only are the zooxanthellae themselves, but corals really are as well, because the corals are getting that primary producing from the zooxanthellae. And so a lot of organisms will eat the corals. And so the corals is a huge food source for many, many different organisms. Um, Therefore, when you leave, when you lose those corals, it's not just the 3D structure that you're losing because the calcium carbonate skeletons do stay there, but it's that primary productivity that you're losing. You're losing the base level of your food chain, which means every level after that is going to be affected and potentially in a very, very negative way. All right. So again, the corals provide the zooxanthellae with things like carbon dioxide, phosphorite, nitrogen, stuff like that. These are all byproducts that we produce when we go through metabolic activities like digesting our food. Um, so those are all really good things for the zooxanthellae because the zooxanthellae need all that stuff. If they're doing photosynthesis, you need CO2, right? You need phosphate, you need, um, carbon or nitrogen. You need all those things because essentially you're like a plant. You need those nutrients. So the zooxanthellae absolutely need those things 
which the coral reef provides as it goes through its metabolic activities, just like we do when we expel out CO2. Now the zooxanthellae provides photosynthesis and therefore sugars for the coral reefs. So now the coral reefs actually have food. So it's again, this very mutualistic relationship. Um, so it's not just the zooxanthellae are getting a structure and a place to live. They're actually getting the nutrients that they need and the minerals and stuff that they need directly from the corals, which is great. Again, very, very mutualistic. Now, here's exactly how that works. So inside the, um, basically the, the tissue of the cnidarian, of the little coral, right? What you have is the zooxanthellae, which live almost, you can think of kind of like embedded in the tissues, almost like a chloroplast of a plant cell, right? This big round zooxanthellae is actually going to be able to take in the sunlight, take in CO2, take in the water that's already there, and it's gonna provide organic material, usually in the form of sugars like glucose, fructose, stuff like that. Um, and not only that, but they're also going to be able to produce oxygen. And who needs oxygen? The coral. Again, because they're doing cellular respiration. They're taking those sugars and those nutrients, and with the help of oxygen, they're breaking it down into usable bits of ATP. Without oxygen, you wouldn't be able to do this. Yes, there is oxygen in the water. In the tropics, there's an abundance of oxygen in the water. Well, typically, if the temperatures get too hot, it actually uh, expels the oxygen, it releases the oxygen out of the water. Therefore, if it gets too hot, you actually don't get the oxygen you need. So then some of these marine organisms can suffocate, even though they're in the ocean, surrounded by oxygen, it's still not enough. Um, so again, that's another benefit of the zooxanthellae is they're producing oxygen, they're producing sugar, the, the coral gets to use them. Therefore, the coral does metabolism and it produces things like CO2, which the zooxanthellae needs. So it's this very, very mutualistic, balanced relationship um, that if, if, if out of balance can do some really nasty things to both of these guys. So here are some of the typical interactions that we see. You guys have seen this before, right? We have a basal level here of our primary producers. You're gonna have things like some of these algaes are gonna be able to survive. Um, some photosynthetic bacteria are gonna be able to survive doing photosynthesis. And then you're finally, you're gonna have your corals and your zooxanthellae algae living inside those corals. So these are kind of the base levels here. They're gonna provide foods like for the grazers. Some of these grazers are things like parrotfish and parrotfish, which we've already seen their beak before. They kind of have this like the sharp, well, not sharp, but almost like rounded, like crushing beak. And that's because they do, they will actually grab parts of the coral and eat the whole thing, including the calcium carbonate skeleton. They'll grab it and they'll chew it up. And then they digest the polyp part, the organic part. And then what they do is they essentially release the non-organic part, the calcium carbonate part. Uh, and that becomes the sediment, the sand, and the cute stuff you walk on on a tropical sandy beach is sand that probably came out the backside of a parrotfish. Yep. Just like the sea cucumbers, a lot of sand are going through those parrotfish. Um, detritus feeders, perfect because you got a lot of that waste coming out. These guys are going to be eating that sediment, taking out any organics that were left, like poop and dead bodies. I know, but poop and dead bodies, a lot of nutrients there. Um, and then recycling it back. You're going to have your coral and corals, coral mucus feeders. So they're actually feeding on the mucus that is produced from the corals or the actual polyps themselves. There's different butterfly fish, um, that have these very long, uh, like plucker mouths, which we've seen before too. And they're going to and they're actually gonna grab individual polyps. Remember the polyps are between one and three millimeters. So you have to have a very long skinny, almost like a straw like mouth that you can suck, just little by little, suck up these tiny, tiny little individual coral polyps because they don't have the big crushing jaws like the parrotfish. They can't just crunch off a big part of it and then digest what they want and release the rest. They have to actually go and nitpick each and every individual coral polyp. And then finally, you're gonna have things like your plankton feeders. There are some amounts of plankton floating in the ocean. Obviously, it's not completely barren, but that's why tropical waters are so clear is because there's very little primary producing. There's very little plankton, either zooplankton or phytoplankton. Unlike our waters, which are dark and murky, which looks scary, but it's actually very, very healthy. Now, it doesn't mean the coral reefs aren't healthy. It's just they're healthy in a different way. They're utilizing the different types of primary producers, unlike us, which are using mostly phytoplankton and um, algaes on our coast at least. And then of course finally you have your top predators. Things like your um, cuttlefish, your sharks, some predatory snails. Remember snails man, snails are pretty crazy with the little drills they drill into your shell and suck you out with the digestive enzymes. Yeah so still on the top predator um, level here. <laughs>
So here's a picture of a typical coral reef. It actually looks a lot kind of like what a healthy uh, coral or healthy ecosystem in Florida would look like. So you have your damsel fishes. You can always tell a damsel fish, by the way, they always have a heart shaped tail. Right? I don't know why they're called damsel fishes, maybe because it's like a damsel in distress. It's my heart. But they always have a heart shaped tail like the Garibaldi. The Garibaldi, the California state marine fish that we have out here, is a damsel fish because of that heart shaped tail. Triggerfish are really cool. If you came to the aquarium, uh, if you've ever been to an aquarium, you've probably seen a triggerfish. They swim really weird with their dorsal and their anal um, uh, pelvic fin. They kind of like wave it back and forth like this, like a mola. They also have this dorsal spine right here, which is what gives them the name the triggerfish. What they do is if they were to get a hook in their mouth, they would swim under a rock, wedge themselves in there, and then kick up this dorsal spine. This dorsal spine is very, very hard and extremely hard to break. So if you're pulling, right, you actually wouldn't be able to pull very hard because he's secured himself under a rock now. However, people have learned that all you need to do is go up there and, right, if you're a free diver, say, and you're spearfishing, all you gotta do is, with your little finger, just push the, the dorsal spin right back down, and now you can pull the fish out. Hence, trigger, right? Trigger. You just push it down. Um, these guys can sometimes be very territorial and very angry, and so when I was in Thailand, they had what's called the cone of danger. So if this is you, you have to pay attention to who's swimming above you, because if you are, sorry, just kidding. You're the trigger fish, and above the trigger fish is the cone of danger. So if you see a trigger fish, you don't want to swim into the cone of danger because they get very territorial above them in this like weird triangle form. So our, our dive leader was like, don't do it. They get really angry. They'll come after you. And I was like, okay. And then like 10 minutes later, he totally did it. And I'm like, trigger fish, trigger fish, trigger fish, trigger fish. Because this is the underwater symbol for trigger fish. So I'm like, nothing. Luckily, the triggerfish never saw him, so he swam in and out of the cone of danger, but we went around. We're like, nope, not doing that. Um, they're not really going to hurt you, but, you know, some fish get really aggressive. It can just make you uneasy and nervous. Uh, let's see. We have things like sea fans. These are big, and they're usually purple, They're at least in the Keys. They're beautiful. They kind of flow back and forth, hence sea fan as the tide comes in and out. Just kind of like this, really gentle. Brain coral, that's this guy right here, big brain, kind of looks like a brain. Some of these guys get absolutely massive, and those are the ones that would be thousands of years old. You have things like flatworms, you have snails, you have crabs, you have little sea stars. Um, you have some zooplankton, some zooplankton. Um, you have things like wrasses, right, those little cleaner wrasses that we talked about. Um, so you'll have cleaner stations and stuff where these fish will just wait and a larger fish will swim up. And then the cleaner wrasses will actually start picking at them to get to remove those exo, ectoparasites. In fact, sometimes they will open their mouth and the fish will go into their mouth and start cleaning out the gills in the mouth and stuff like that. And now it does hurt the fish because you're ripping off little parasites. Like imagine you had a tick and someone just started ripping it off of you. It would hurt a little bit. So you see these fishes flinch a little bit, but it's still beneficial to them because nobody needs to be covered in parasites. It's actually really bad for your health to be covered in parasites. So these little cleaner asses are super helpful for that. Cleaner shrimp the same way, you know, they go, they basically go in. A lot of times they're with uh, moray eels, those cleaner shrimp. Parrotfish again are going to be chomping on those corals, chomping on those big bits of corals and then releasing out the non-organic part. Um, butterfly fishes again are going to be poking out little tiny polyps, depending on their morphology, obviously. Um, and yeah, these are typical. Oh, this is a little sea urchin. They don't look exactly the same as our sea urchins out here, but they look pretty close depending on where you are. Um, some have really big thick spines that are almost like little fingers. It looks like a ball with like little fingers. This. Some have really, really long, sharp, skinny spines. Um, I've only ever seen an urchin one time in the entire time I've ever been to the Keys. And we were in the sandbar. We were basically just at a sandbar. It's just a shallow area where people go and drive their boats up to and just hang out and walk around. It's the middle of nowhere. Um, and we parked and I went, Dad, oh my God, a sea urchin. He's like, yeah, that's crazy. And I was like, don't step on him. Five minutes later, he stepped on the only sea urchin I've ever seen in the entire Keys and got a big old spine in his foot, which, um, again, they're serrated backwards. So it's like a serrated knife. You go in to pull out, you'd have to like shred even more. So it is, I think, still in his foot. Yeah, that was like last year sometime. Yeah, your body will naturally just build a little calcium around it and then push it out eventually. So he'll be fine. But yeah, he was screaming for a while. It hurt. It's kind of funny. I laughed. I mean, he didn't, but I did. All right. So predation. Predation, remember, we talked about competition is such a big deal in the tropics and in the coral reef system. So this is why predation and deterring predation is actually kind of really important. Um, 
So a lot of these coral reefs are actually going to produce either toxins or these really foul tastes. And that's kind of like the, the way the butterflies do, the way that some poisonous tree frogs do. They don't really have any other defensive mechanisms. So they basically just get really gross. They get really gross, they produce these toxins. They're like, this is the only defense mechanism I have, is chemical, is chemically. And that's the only way that they can um, protect themselves against a coral. Imagine if you're a little polyp, you can't protect yourself. So you would actually have to be foul tasting or, or toxic even um, to be able to keep these predators away. There are things like fire coral. You even touch fire coral, it like shoots these, like it's a type of nematocyst, type of nidal, that's stinging cell, they shoot out at you and actually burns like crazy. One time, one time I was diving and I just, I swam over it and I nicked it with my knee just real quick. My whole leg was on fire for like an hour. And that's just barely kissing it and barely touching it. So kind of crazy. Um, sometimes these guys will actually secrete these toxins and stuff to prevent other organisms from growing on top of them. So I believe that's what we're going to see coming up is it's like these two corals as they grow closer to each other will actually secrete these toxins and these chemicals near each other. Kind of like the anemones that we saw battling each other. It's kind of like that, but they're secreting these chemicals. And so what you'll see is you'll see growth right up until they almost touch, but they don't touch. And that's because they're both secreting chemicals and toxins and stuff to keep the other one. Because otherwise, if one of them outgrows the other one, he's not going to be able to do photosynthesis anymore. And then he's eventually going to die off. Okay, so what they do is they kind of, when they come in contact with each other, they secrete these chemicals to keep, to keep one from out competing or growing on top of the other one. Um, we've already learned things like, um, sponges have things like spicules, right? These spicules or sclerites that are found in, um, in soft corals and stuff are basically these like spiky little internal structures. And so if you were to try to bite down on it, you're essentially, you're going to get like a spike to the roof of your mouth. So any kind of like hard structure or these spikes or spicules are going to kind of prevent any organism from trying to chew on them. Now these parrot fish can get over that because they have a really hard internal mouth. They almost have these like crushing plates. Um, but most of these other organisms cannot, and therefore they don't eat these corals or these soft um, sponges because, or soft, uh, soft corals, because they have these things like these little sclerites and, um, and spicules to basically just get right in the roof of your mouth. Um, so yeah, sponges are producing their spicules, soft, soft corals have their sclerites. It's almost kind of like um, um, analogous, like it's almost the same, it's, um, but two different, spe uh, two different phylums, obviously. Um, ooh, the coralline algae also has a encrusting form, which essentially encrusting just kind of means like a crust on top of. So think like a dead coral would actually grow some encrusting coralline algae over it. And that's like the red algae, the really hard stuff. We saw some of it in the intertidal zone, or if you've ever been to it, you've maybe seen like a purple rock, right? That's not a purple rock. It's actually encrusting algae. And so it's really hard and you'd have to scrape against the rock, which can be really rough on your mouth. And therefore that kind of deters predators from actually being able to, um, to go after them. Um, again, competition is really, really high for light, for space, for growth. So you better be quick growing or you better outcompete someone in some other way. So you don't grow wide, you know, you don't grow very fast, but you grow very tall. So then you can still outgrow the bottom ones who don't grow very tall and get that sunlight. Or you grow very fast and you grow wide really fast and you shade everybody else so that you get all the sunlight and there's nobody growing on top of you. Um, so again, very, very difficult to, to um, establish yourself early on without all this you know, terrible competition trying to knock you out of there. Um, if you are going to be a slow grower, you better be massive. Like I said, so the slow growing, you're, you're big and you're wide and you're like, all right, I'm resilient and I'm slow growing, but eventually I'm going to get there and eventually I'm going to be able to outcompete you. Um, so again, you have to be very, very massive and therefore grow over everybody else if you're not one of those fast growing ones. And again, we already talked about how the corals can actually sting each other, um, sting each other with these nidils, release these chemicals to keep each other away. Um, basically do anything that they can, like the anemones, to say, hey, that's your territory, this is mine, back off. Uh, and that's what we see right here. So these are two different species of corals that are trying to grow, and that's what you see, boom. They basically, this thin line right here where nothing is growing, and that's because they're stinging each other, they're, submit, they're secreting these toxins towards each other, and they're just trying to keep each other from out-competing each other. Uh, and therefore growing on top of each other and blocking each other from doing photosynthesis. So now they're going to stop basically right there, without actually, um, you know, hurting one another severely. And you can kind of see here, 
it almost looks like there's like a little dead bit almost for each of them and that is true you can actually get um parts of them that are died off because they're being attacked so many times that all the polyps in that little area are going to die off but the calcium skeleton stays and the rest of it kind of stays you know at least a little bit away from each other so that they they don't completely kill each other uh, again, competition on the reef is so very, very important. So this idea of resource partitioning comes out. Remember, resource partitioning is using the same resource or similar resources in slightly different ways. Maybe you feed at different times. Maybe you feed on this part of the coral and I feed on this part of the coral. So we're not directly in competition with each other. Um, again, very important to sustain diversity. So if you have um, resource partitioning, then you can have more species, different species, and more abundance of species instead of everybody just competing directly with each other and then possibly out competing each other and going and causing one of the organisms to go towards extinct or at least die out in that particular area. So resource partitioning, very, very important. And with that said, that's all I have for you guys. Um, uh, fun fact, one more thing about um, uh, predator avoidance, I didn't, I didn't have it in the slide, but I just want to talk about it. There are some species of fish who do sleep at night. In fact, a lot of organisms will still sleep at night. They'll kind of go dormant or inactive for some period of time just to rest like we do too. Um, parrotfish are actually really cool. Parrotfish and other species of fish like that can actually secrete a mucus net. So they'll wedge themselves into a little hole in the reef. Um, and this is something you can see happening around dusk and dawn. You'll actually see um, species shift. So you'll have the day species out during the day, and then at dusk, you'll start to see less of the day species, and you'll start to see a little bit of the night species, and then all of a sudden at night, you see none of the day species, and you only see the night species that are active at night. Um, so what some of those day species will do at night to protect themselves is they'll secrete this little like mucus net around them. And so if a predator, a night predator like a shark was out there, and he's kind of poking around, he'd come to this mucus net and be like, I don't, it doesn't smell like food. I don't, and maybe even the mucus smells gross or is nasty and you're just like, I don't, you know, you might be food in there, but I don't know, it just doesn't seem worth it. So they essentially sleep in these little like mucus cocoons to protect themselves, which is actually pretty cool. Because again, you can't be out all day, every day, 24 seven, watching out for these predators. You have to protect yourself sometime when you're, when you're sleeping or when you're resting a little bit. Um, so that's, that's what parrotfish do, which is pretty cool. So... Terrible dad joke, your favorite, I know. Hopefully this was helpful for you guys, and um, I might have some video guys that, that I'll add on later, but otherwise, have a wonderful day, have a wonderful rest of your week, and make sure to constantly check the Canvas site for homework updates and stuff like that. I know we're getting almost close to the end of the semester, so you guys are almost there, a couple more lectures, um, and then we're almost done. So good luck to you guys, have a wonderful day, and I'll see you soon.